Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott. Today I wanted to talk about the multiverse. In fact, the multiverses. There are a variety of different concepts of the multiverse discussed in quantum mechanics. And my goal with this episode is to go into it further. We see discussion of the way the multiverse works in a variety of different movies and TV shows. And when I say multiverse, oftentimes there's a limited concept of what that means. And in fact, there are a variety of ways of understanding what the multiverse is. We exist in a multiverse. I've experienced the multiverse for myself. There's not one reality with one history. There are multiple realities with multiple histories and we are shifting in and out of these multiverses and the veil between these different realities is thinning. More and more people are experiencing these different realities. And what I find really fascinating is as we become aware of the multiverse, we start to see it reflected in our fiction, in the media, in the wonderful books that we read, TV shows that we watch. It's everywhere. Science fiction involving parallel universes seems to be a reflection that we are entering into the multiversal age and it's growing significantly. There are so many amazing movies and I've dedicated an episode to going over different movies and shows in the media that talk about parallel universes. But I want to come back to that a little bit because these movies and works of fiction tell us a lot more about how the multiverse works and helps us to understand how to maneuver through it. I believe that this is a subconscious part of the human psyche reaching out and explaining these mysteries. So it's good for us to go back and understand how they work. First of all, the first two movies that come to mind are Sliding Doors and Run, Lolo, Run. Two amazing movies. These two movies, neither of which is technically science fiction, were released in 1998. We see the idea of timelines branching from a single point, which lead to different outcomes. In the example of sliding doors, a separate timeline branches off of the first timeline and then exists in parallel for some time, overlapping the main timeline before merging back. In Run Lola Run, on the other hand, we see Lola, the main character, trying to rescue her boyfriend, Manny, by rewinding what happened and making different choices multiple times. A sort of revision. We see what Rizwan Virk calls running our core loop might look like in a real high world, high stress situation. Then there's the movie The 13th Floor. This one is a great representation of ancestor simulations, which I talk about in my episode on simulations. And the protagonist finds out he is living in a simulation. One of the RPG players who exists outside the simulation tells him that their simulation is one of thousands. The thing that makes this simulation unique is that it is the only one where they in turn develop their own ancestor simulations or nested simulations inside of simulations. Although we see only the nested simulations and not the parallel ones, they are definitely there, which means that it is faithfully representing a simulated multiverse with different nested simulations within the multiverse. So there's a concept of different nested simulations within a simulation. One of my favorite shows, Fringe, and also Counterpart. In the 21st century, two popular TV shows demonstrate the idea of a single parallel world that has somehow split off from this world, but retains many similarities, including a shared history. The source of the divergence is never explained fully, but the existence of a parallel world with alternative versions of the main characters is the key plot point. Both shows reveal that some physics phenomena was responsible for either breaching away into the other universe or causing a branch off the main universe to create the second one. So it's possible there's just one single parallel reality. 
Then, of course, there's Sliders from 1995. The science fiction series is a more direct example of navigating a quantum multiverse. In Sliders, wormholes are used to visit other universes, each of which deviates in some way from our own, many with different versions of the main characters. How do they develop the wormhole? The main character is shown how by a different parallel version of himself. Now, the book that I just read for the second time, and I never reread books, but there is an amazing book that you have to read called Dark Matter by Blake Crouch. This one is going to be on Apple TV Plus very soon, and I may have to do an entire deep dive on it. In this particular one, the hero of the novel, Dark Matter, Jason Disson, a failed quantum physicist who is happy with his life, he's like a professor in college, encounters an alternate version of himself. This alternate version was more successful as a physicist and developed a machine which can put large objects into superposition. This device results in an ability to go to different universes and encounter alternate versions of everyone. In that particular one, he finds a drug that creates the brain and puts it into a state so it's not observational. And then when he goes into this box, then he's in a Schrodinger cat type of situation scientifically. And this device results in an ability to go to different universes and encounter alternate universes and versions of everything. The other Jason Disson, the brilliant one, decides to steal the main character's wife because he's happy at home. And then chaos ensues and you follow the main character as he tries to find his way back home because the, the physicist traps him in another world. Another one is Flash Arrowverse and the Marvel Multiverse. In Flash and the Arrowverse, the team gets to other Earth by teaming up with a billionaire physicist who is running a particle accelerator and the experiment goes terrible and allows for the development of super abilities and plot lines involving these multiple Earths are complicated, but there are colorful versions of the main characters. And then Marvel has explored this in especially the show Loki, which is the wonderful series that has a time variance authority whose mission it is to prune off multiple timelines before they have a chance to blossom into a full multiverse. These timelines are all depicted on an old television type screen as an ongoing tree-like structure with branches pruned off before they become too big. Without the TVA to enforce the single sacred timeline, Loki is told eventually we would get chaos and a multiversal war. This is the starting point for the multiverse of madness. There is an important point in most of these stories. The main characters are able to interact with one or more parallel universes. How is this done? Although this isn't usually explained in too much detail, it often involves particle accelerators, wormhole generators, psychic abilities. Then there's the concept of overlapping timelines. In the 1998 movie Sliding Doors, we find a vivid example of multiple timelines that branch out and then merge again, which is a phenomenon I believe I've experienced. When branched, it's as if the two branches are occupying the same time and each protagonist sees the versions of the other characters and senses them that something else might be going on. The name of the movie is drawn from the premise that sets the alternate timelines into motion. So in the movie, Gwyneth Paltrow gets fired from her job and on her way home, she gets on the subway. We see magically one version get on the subway and one version that stays outside the sliding doors missing the train. And that sets off two intertwining timelines. In one of these timelines, Paltrow's character sits next to James who strikes up a conversation with her and then she arrives home early to find her fiance, Jerry, in bed with another woman. In this timeline, she breaks off her relationship with Jerry and sets out on her own, starting a PR firm and meeting James again, with whom she starts a relationship. Meanwhile, back in the original timeline, 
Helen suspects that something is wrong with Gary, but she arrives too late to catch him in the act. After a series of events, she finds that she's miserable with him in that timeline. The movie does a good job of trying to show what might happen if there were a macro decision point where the timelines branch off. There are different types of multiverses, according to scientists. In his book, The Hidden Reality, Columbia professor of physics and mathematics, Brian Greene, gives us an overview of nine possible types of parallel universes, each of which results from different theories in physics. Green gives colorful names to them, such as the quilted universe, inflationary multiverse, and the quantum multiverse. He even refers briefly to a simulated multiverse, MIT professor of physics Max Tegmark covers similar ground in his papers and books. Though his classification uses a numbering system labeling each multiverse with a level from 1 through 4. For our discussions, you can boil down the list of possible universes to five types. Type 1, black holes and wormholes as gateways to other universes, whereas Einstein revolutionized our understanding of time and space in his special theory of relativity, it was his general theory of relativity published in 1915 that really made waves in cosmology. Einstein told us to visualize space-time as a flat surface, for example, a tablecloth that is flat and uniform when there are no objects on it. When objects are put on it, they cause indentations in the tablecloth or think of a bowling ball on a foam surface these indentations produce curvature in the fabric of space and time gravity said einstein is a result of this curvature theoretically he predicted the curvature of space time should bend light it was british astronomer sir arthur eddington who confirmed the predicted bending of light in an expedition during a solar eclipse in 1919, instantly making Einstein the most famous scientist in the world. Further confirmation of the general theory came throughout the 1920s. One aspect of general relativity which arose from astronomer Carl Schwarzschild solving Einstein's field equations was that an extremely dense star would have a very high gravity field that made it difficult for anything to escape. This resulted in a prediction of a singularity, a point that has such high density that it causes a rip in the fabric of space-time itself. This area was referred to as a black hole by John Wheeler in the 1960s, and his name stuck. Although black holes have become very popular in science fiction, there was a time when most scientists thought they didn't exist, but were just a mathematical curiosity resulting from Schwarzschild's solution to Einstein's equations. The equations show a theoretical sphere around the singularity that is part of the black hole, and anything that passes this point, including light, is unable to escape the gravity of the singularity. The boundary of theoretical sphere is defined as the event horizon, which is defined by Schwarzschild radius from the singularity outward. The first black hole wasn't discovered until 1964 using X-ray astronomy. The first black hole to be photographed occurred in 2019 using data gathered from telescopes all over the Earth. So what do black holes have to do with parallel universes? Some scientists believe that if you go inside a black hole, you have the possibility of entering a wormhole, which was more formally defined as an Einstein-Rosen bridge. Where would this wormhole take you? The answer is up for debate. But many physicists are concerned that because of the warping of time and space that happens in a black hole, there could be bridges to anywhere and any time. Some say it would take you to another part of our universe. A common trope on Star Trek is the existence of wormholes that can open and transport a starship to a faraway part of the galaxy, such as in Deep Space Nine and in Voyager. In his book, Parallel Universes, physicist Fred Allen Wolf tells of meeting Dr. Martin Kruskal at UCLA in the 1960s. Kruskal, a highly respected mathematician who worked on the Manhattan Project, created maps 
that showed that a black hole might be a doorway to a parallel universe, though a different kind of parallel universe than the ones we have been explaining in this episode. When Kruskal tried to draw maps of space-time inside the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole, he found that because time slows down to a standstill, there was actually two singularities, one in the past and one in the future. When time going in reverse from another, i.e. forward in a black hole and backwards in a white hole, whereas John Wheeler coined the term black hole, the term of white holes came into general usage by physicists looking to name Kruskal's opposite singularity. Australian mathematician Roy Kerr took Kruskal's solution further by coming up with a solution for a rotating black hole that showed there was an infinite patchwork of parallel universes which could be formed via black holes and reach through wormholes. These solutions were and are, of course, theoretical. No one has been able to show that a black hole goes to one parallel universe, let alone many such universes. Even if black holes behave this way, it wasn't clear whether it would be possible to travel through them, that is, whether they are traversable. Perhaps more interesting from our perspective is that a black hole's gravity distortion is of such magnitude that it not only curbs space but correspondingly curbs time. In the movie Interstellar, for example, a ship that goes to a planet near a black hole finds that they are subject to significant time dilation effects. Some scientists believe that a black hole or a singularity could make it possible to create what are called closed time-like curves in space-time. That would be a curve that allows you to go back to some point in the past. Although Einstein's equations don't rule this out, physicists have looked into ways that they might be created to travel through time. Kip Thorne and some of his colleagues at Caltech, for example, have worked out a framework whereby wormholes could be used to send an object on such a closed time-like curve. Wormholes and black holes are interesting, of course, but this type of parallel universe is one way we can only dream about at the moment because of the difficulty of accessing the gravity of a black hole. Moreover, the difficulty in creating a traversable wormhole that would stay open and not collapse immediately as soon as it was formed is another unknown. It is something that, theoretically, an arbitrarily advanced civilization might be able to do since Einstein's equations don't rule it out. There are physicists who believe that we will be able to create small black holes or wormholes at some point in the future. This would allow us to tunnel through to a different universe or spawn new timelines. Just some people have accused CERN of doing and causing Mandela effects and people have looked back on when CERN was turned on as a key point in which many of the Mandela effects have occurred. The next two types of parallel universes have to do with cosmology and the idea of an inflationary universe. They also have to do with what you can call the magic of infinity. When something can't be explained, one mental trick that physicists and philosophers sometimes use is to imagine infinity, a number that is so large that it can't actually be imagined. Because it's so large, even if you were to subtract infinity or double infinity, you would still end up with infinity. In that sense, it's a special number, like zero, and not a number at all, but a placeholder. This type of multiverse arises from simply assuming that our physical universe is infinite. Now, the farthest distance that we can look is approximately 13.7 billion light years away, which cosmologists put as the age of our universe based on how far the cosmic background radiation has traveled to us. They estimate this to be the time since the Big Bang, currently the most popular theory about the origin of the universe. In addition, physicists have found that other galaxies are moving away from us and from each other. In fact, they are moving away from us at such a pace that at some point we will no longer be able to see them because we are limited to our ability to see only those from which the speed of light can reach us. There are parts of the universe that, if the current expansion continues, we were able to observe at some point, but will no longer be able to see because their light will never reach us. This is the first mental trick, and what I think is the simplest type of parallel universe is bubbles of observable universes in a much bigger, infinite space 
That is our physical universe. If the universe is infinite, then if we take infinity minus the size of our observable universe, how much space is left? It's still infinite. This means that there is an infinite amount of space that we can never observe. In that space, the assumption is that there will be every configuration of particles that can fit inside a bubble that is roughly the size of our observable universe. This is why this version is often called the doppelganger universe, because if you think of all the particles in the observable universe, let's say a big number like 10 to the 80th, then as you go farther out, there would be another observable universe of the same size, like another bubble outside of our bubble. Each bubble might have the same number of particles, but the number of par total particles is essentially infinite. The idea is that somewhere in these bubbles of observable universes, even though they are all in the same physical infinite universe, a set of particles will be assembled just like our Earth. And there will even be a version of you, perhaps even listening to this podcast, given a finite number of particles and infinite number of bubbles of that many particles, each pattern will repeat somewhere, kind of like the Boltzmann brain. To be honest, I find this version of the multiverse rather unconvincing, or at the very least, unlikely to lead to kinds of multiple timelines with doppelgangers that we talk about and explore with quantum jumps. The chance that there really is another me would rely not just on the particles being exactly the way they are in our universe bubble, but also on a very similar history. Even proponents of this type of multiverse agree that they will have a very different history from those in our universe, even though it evolved from the same part of the Big Bang, which means that it has the same set of physics, rules, and constants that we have. Unlikely, because even small changes in initial conditions can cause great variance in the results a phenomenon that is studied in complexity and chaos theory. The counter-argument is that infinity takes care of that by saying, even if that version of Earth doesn't have you, but has me, there's always another doppelganger universe somewhere out there that has both of us. Through the magic of infinity, there would be an infinity of universes with particles exactly like ours. Complexity theory shows us that some algorithms produce stable configurations, whereas others produce chaotic ones, which means that they don't repeat in a predictable way. There are many assumptions about this type of parallel observable universe, but it certainly brings us some strange philosophical and scientific questions and feels a bit like hand-waving. Infinity becomes the new god, able to wave its magical wand to make every configuration appear an infinite number of times. The third type is inflationary bubbles. In type two, we just need to assume that the universe is infinite and that each bubble universe evolved from the same set of initial conditions or fluctuations. It also relies on expansion to a certain extent because it means that what is not observable now will never become observable. It is also means that the laws of physics are similar to our universe's bubble. There is another version of the bubble universes that provides for weirder bubbles with different laws of physics than our own. In fact, the other universes in this model may be nothing like ours. This type of multiverse relies heavily on the idea of cosmological inflation, which is defined as a phase of exponential growth that came after the initial blast of the Big Bang. I like to think of the difference between inflation and expansion like the different speeds at which you can inflate a balloon. If you blow air out into the balloon manually yourself, it expands slowly and eventually gets to the intended shape as long as you keep blowing. However, if you hook it up to a machine as a professional balloonist, the expansion happens very rapidly. The idea of cosmological inflation, or just inflation for short, was proposed by Alan Guth, now a physics professor from MIT, while he was working at the Stanford Linear Accelerator with his colleagues as a way to solve a number of problems with the existing theories of origins of the universe. The basic idea is that this inflationary period began very soon after the Big Bang. In this case, I mean very soon, from approximately 10 to the negative 36 seconds after 
the Big Bang. That means that the whole process of cosmic inflation started and ended before a single second had passed from the Big Bang. The insight that Guth and his colleagues had was that there was a period of repulsive gravity. As mentioned earlier in Einstein's general theory of relativity, space-time is pictured as a two-dimensional tablecloth, and objects placed there create an indent in the fabric of space-time. This indent defines how other objects that are less massive or more massive would interact with it. During a period of repulsive gravity, rather than indenting the whole fabric, would spread out very quickly as everything moved away from each other. Once the fast inflation was done, the universe resumed a more gradual expansion like what we see today. Guth and his colleagues, Andrew Lind of Stanford and Alexander Valentkin of Tufts, realized that this inflation wasn't just a one-time event. In fact, every time it happens, this stretches out a tiny bit of space-time into a very large cavern of space-time. This cavern is perhaps as large as our universe. In other worlds, every time this process happens, a brand new universe is created, and this universe is not accessible to the residents of the previous universe. In this version of the multiverse, which Green calls the inflationary multiverse, each universe is a distinct region resulting from the initial Big Bang. However, because the inflation happens so rapidly, it amplifies whatever fluctuations were happening in the little bit of space that started the whole process. Now, I know some of that sounds a little bit complicated, but if you're like me and you truly want to study the different ways that multiverses exist, this stuff fascinates me. Unlike the more static, endless, expansionary, doppelganger universe we were just talking about, where we're relying on distances to separate universes, each universe is literally inaccessible to the others. These universes are divided not by empty space, which could be traversed, but by a gulf that cannot be traversed. Even if you were going faster than the speed of light, because they may rely on different laws of physics. Green uses the analogy that a large block of Swiss cheese as the original universe that results from the Big Bang and each time a cosmological inflation happens it creates a new hole in the Swiss cheese. In this model each hole is thought of as a bubble or pocket universe. What is between the holes? Using this analogy the area in between the holes i.e. the cheese is still unstable and may undergo inflation at any time creating a new bubble universe. In fact it may not even have the same physics as the other universes do. Each newly created universe is a parallel universe but with a different value set for many of the constants that we take for granted. This version is one of the types that are better equipped to tackle the mystery of what scientists call the fine-tuning principle. Put briefly, the fine-tuning principle is based on the observation there are a handful of characteristics about our universe that just so happen to be perfect for the formation of galaxies, planets, and of course, for the emergence of our kind of life. In the inflationary universe, each bubble universe contains galaxies and planets and everything else we see. Recall that each bubble or pocket universe was the result of quantum seed fluctuations when the initial universe was quite small and each region of rapid expansion created its own bubble. However, if any of these original variables or seed fluctuations were different, we might end up with a different kind of universe with very different kinds of physical constants. For instance, MIT physicist Max Tegmark calculated that if the cosmic seed fluctuation amplitude, which was approximately 0.002% varied and became smaller, galaxies would never form. If it was much larger, there would be other difficulties resulting in a much larger volume of collisions. You would have different ratios of magnetic force, protons would be heavier, electromagnetic force would be weaker, gravity would be different, dark energy is what physicists call a force that's causing our universe expansion to accelerate over time, and that might be different. In this version of the multiverse, we see why a multiverse provides a rationale for fine-tuning in the anthropic principle, since each universe might have its own values for things like gravity, cosmological constants, and general laws. I really think the first explanation that the universe is a fluke is unlikely, which leaves number two and number three, design or the multiverse. Some would say that these two are mutually exclusive, 
that you could have a creator or creators or you could have an infinite number of universes in a multiverse but as the old saying goes never the twain shall meet the whole point i'm trying to make is that number two and three are true that we are in a simulation and it is one of many simulations being run on some advanced races computer system and the only simulations that are allowed to run beyond a certain point are the ones where life arises these may or may not be ancestor simulations in fact the beings doing the simulations might be completely different from us in a simulated multiverse we would need to have an infinite number of dead universes where no life exists hanging around like evolution whatever is driving the creation and random changes that occur between universes would also be responsible for pruning the tree of new universes to those that actually meet this criteria only those that could sustain for example planets and stars and life would be allowed to run beyond a certain point even if we take number three to be the case on its own although bubble universes might be able to tackle the fine-tuning principle we are still left with all the strangeness of quantum phenomena in our universe the fourth type is universes in high dimensions a fertile area for alternate parallel universes is that they are hiding in higher dimensions this idea is based on string theory which is yet another conjectured theory of how the universe works einstein himself couldn't find a unified theory that pulled together gravity along with all the other forces in nature like electromagnetism and gravity and weak nuclear force or strong nuclear force quantum field theory on the other hand could explain and predict three of these with the exception of gravity which means that it is also in complete string theory or more formally super string theory came around in the 80s and was lauded as a potential theory of everything which could integrate einstein's relativity and quantum mechanics whereas quantum mechanics showed that everything had fundamental quants or particles in a string theory even those particles are really small vibrating strings the rate of vibration of the strings allows for the difference in particles one byproduct of string theory is the need for additional dimensions beyond the usual three or four if you consider space-time in fact variations of string theory require 10 or 11 dimensions and a type of multiverse that has been discussed by physicists one in which there are universes hiding inside these nearby dimensions despite the initial enthusiasm it gathered today string theory is regarded with some suspicion by some scientists although others believe it still holds the key to a unified theory it is hard to come up with experiments that confirm any of the predictions and in the end it is a lot more speculative and controversial than either general relativity or quantum field theory what would these other dimensions and universes embedded within them look like well for one thing since einstein we are used to talking about time as the fourth dimension and we'll be using it when describing how multiverses evolve geometrically but the history of dimensions is an interesting one and it is recounted by dr michio kaku in his book hyperspace it was the greeks who first stated emphatically the point of physical dimensions being limited to three euclid the founder of euclidean geometry which we all study in high school stated that a point has no dimension a line has no dimension a plane has two dimensions length and width and a solid has three dimensions length width and depth aristotle and later ptolemy from alexandria agreed with euclid but went further to state there were no other dimensions aristotle writes in on heaven the line has magnitude one way the plane in two and the solid in three ways and beyond these there is no other magnitude because the three are all ptolemy went further and offered a proof that there are no higher dimensions but in the 19th century this idea of a limited set of dimensions started to be questioned george friedrich bernard riemann in particular shattered the idea that mathematics should be limited to only three dimensions and no more this gave rise to the riemann geometry and the idea that any shape could be extended into extra dimensions riemann pointed out in particular that the pythagorean theorem could be extended beyond its two-dimension version of sides of a right triangle 
to three dimensions representing the sides and diagonal of a cube, and this could go on to four or five or an arbitrary number of dimensions. Although it's hard for us to visualize a cube of higher dimension, which is called a hypercube or a tesseract, the same principle can be applied to any shape and extended to n-dimensional space or hyperspace as it's referred to today. To visualize a hypercube, we can use the analogy of square in two dimensions, which can then be extended out into a cube in three dimensions and extended to a hypercube in more dimensions. It would mean that the world we see is a projection of a four-dimensional universe into a three dimensions that we can see. This idea was turned into a highly successful novel by Edwin Abbott, a clergyman in the City of London School in 1884 called Flatland, a romance of many dimensions. Now this is interesting because in Flatland it was meant to be a novel about Victorian politics, caught the imagination of the public. In it, Flatlanders are not allowed to talk about the third dimension and all the laws, including those of Mr. Square, the titular hero, are in two dimensions. Like Plato's philosopher who leaves the shackles of the wall in the cave, Mr. Square realizes there is another dimension and tries to tell his fellow Flatlanders who are not ready to listen to him. Prior to Einstein's rise in the worldwide fame in the 20s and the popularization of time as the fourth dimension, this idea of a fourth spatial dimension was quite popular. In his book Hyperspace, Kaku profiles Charles Howard Hinton, a British mathematician and science fiction writer, whom Kaku calls the man who saw the fourth dimension. Hinton, Kaku tells us, even had names for directions in this extra dimension, just like we say left or right, up or down, back and forth. He said that in the fourth dimension the directions were ana or kata. Although the idea of higher dimensions caught on with the public after Riemann introduced the idea in the mid-19th century, it never really caught up with scientists who believed there was no evidence of higher dimension. Riemann's ideas were thought of as abstract math that had nothing to do with the real world, at least until Einstein came along with his special and general theories of relativity. And Einstein's old mentor, Hermann Minkowski, coined the term space-time and time became generally acknowledged as the fourth dimension. Half a century later, in the second half of the 20th century, Riemann geometry would serve as the backdrop for other theories of higher dimensions. If there were other physical dimensions around us, it's not hard to see how there could be other things going on, perhaps even entire universes tucked away in these dimensions, which we can't reach because we are like the Flatlanders. If parallel universes do in fact exist, the tool set for higher dimensions whether they are spatial or even temporal, could come in quite useful. Now, I know I talk about dimensions and densities a lot on this channel. And when we talk spiritually about 5D or fifth dimension or fourth density, are we talking about a physical space that is a parallel reality? Or are we talking about a change? As I've discussed before, Density is different because that talks about a density of light making up the reality. That density of light means that the light particles carry more information. And that is you move into a fourth density environment, things become more complex, there's more information. Fifth dimension as referred to by Maureen St. Germain or fourth dimension who Dronvala Melchizedek refers to is an actual other dimension that is next to ours very much like a parallel reality that has different laws, that has different physics, that interact with our thoughts and things like that in a different way. Now, I know all of that was complicated. And a lot of that is actually pretty generic physics research. I'm quoting stuff that you'll see in most physics books. I know that some of it didn't make sense, but I'm quoting this because I want to bring some air of authority when I talk about dimensions. I've studied the physics of this. What I want to say is that it is like a simulation. The universe is evolving through multiple simulations of parallel realities that are nested in different ways and formats. And it's important for us to discuss this. If you check out my episode, He Who Shrank by Henry Haas, that particular one gives you the idea there are microcosms within microcosms and these other universes could exist in the quantum 
continuously like a Fibonacci sequence. That is another possibility. The more and more I start to analyze this in a meditation space, I understand that all of it is true. There are bubbles of universes, there are nested universes, there are 11 dimensions, there are densities, all of it is true. There is infinite densities and dimensions in every bit of space. A single electron carries infinite universes within it. And that is the truly amazing thing is that within all of these parallel realities, there is life and that the universe is evolving through multiple simulations. Quantum physics is sort of mysterious and for some it's hard to grasp and I know that there are a few of you that turned off this episode. It maybe wasn't making sense or uh, it wasn't as enjoyable as just simply doing affirmations or talking about other things. I think it's important to tune your mind into the scientific reality because there is a portion of your split brain that needs to have the quantitative understanding of the parallel reality. Beyond that, it's not important. But I'm trying to give those people out there that don't believe in the parallel reality theory some idea of the physics behind it. And when we say parallel reality, it really is a very generic term that is referring to a lot of different things. There are different kinds of parallel realities and science tells us there are different ways that they evolve and change and all of them are interesting and in my belief it is a simulation that is running multiple different simulations at the same time and it's self-evolving. Who knows? I would love to get your ideas of it but that's a more physics-based understanding of the many multiverses that, that exist and Perhaps I will explore this further if this is something that you're interested in. You can find all episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com. Check out my art at www.newearth.art. And welcome to The Reality Revolution. <laughs>